So we're still going to be working our way through the book of James, almost done. We're in James chapter 5, which is on page 1199 in your pew Bible. If you'd like to turn there, read along. Karen Keith, can I ask you to pray for the Lord's blessing on his word this morning? Father God, we're here to worship you, adore you, and we are so thankful that as a body of Christ we can come and hear your word. Touch our hearts today, Lord, and you can ask Tony as he brings his message from your word so we can receive it from you as a gift. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Go to read verses uh, 7 through 12, having patience in suffering. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its vulnerable crop, valuable crop, and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Let your yes be yes and your no, no, or you will be condemned. Well, it's important to understand what he is addressing here to the people that he wrote this letter to. And that's one thing I've done during this time of going through James is to go back to the purpose of the letter. And he was writing to people, to Jewish Christians who had been dispersed from Jerusalem into Judea to live among the Gentiles. As one guy I read wrote, the young church, these, these Christians who had come to faith in Jesus were kicked around the Mediterranean like a soccer ball. I thought that would be appropriate illustration this morning. And they were really struggling to find how they fit in. Think about it. To tomorrow, our faith becomes illegal. The government will press down upon us and persecute us. Organized religion will see us as some sort of a radical sect because we believe in sin, grace, forgiveness. Only the blood of Jesus Christ is forgiveness for our sins. And that will become offensive to many people, especially in these last days. And we have to disperse to small home churches throughout Menden, Uxbridge, Webster, Douglas. We're relegated to privatizing our faith to a certain degree. And that's a very likely scenario down the road. But they had to leave their homes, their communities, their jobs, the culture that they knew. Everything revolved around their faith and their religion. Their communities were built. And all of a sudden, it began in Jerusalem with the martyrdom of Stephen. And suddenly the church was persecuted by Herod, persecuted by the Jews, and they had to disperse and run away or they'd be killed. So they left everything behind. No jobs. Take what you have on your back and what you can carry and go. 
and reestablish yourself. And this is who James is writing to, people that were in this situation and they were trying to maintain their faith in Christ while developing new community among a heathen people. And they were struggling financially, especially because they would have to take whatever work they could get. There was no established, you know, monster.com. No, you had to go out and say, hey, where can I get a job? You know anybody that's looking for help today? And they would go, and because they were so dependent upon the, the aristocracy or the wealthy people who would hire them for the day to clean their fields, to glean their fields, to, rate, to, to just to work like servants or slaves. And then they would shortchange them at the end of the day. So you, I'm going to pay you $20 an hour, so at the end of the day today I owe you 160 bucks. Well, I haven't got all of that, so here's 110 I, You had to take what you could get. That was a real suffering for them. Many couldn't afford to even buy what they needed for their families. So these are the issues that he's dealing with, and he says to them, be patient, brothers, because God is coming back soon. Jesus' return is imminent. Be patient in your suffering until the Lord's coming. This was a great and glorious hope that they had to hold deep within their hearts that the day would be coming soon, that Jesus would be coming back. He says to them, see how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You know, farmers have a really tough gig because they are so dependent upon things that they have no control of. Soil conditions, weather conditions, pest conditions. They really rely upon it. Bronda and Ruth grew up on a small farm in West Virginia, and they were dependent upon that farm to provide their needs. And they had to work every day. All the sisters had to work every day at their chores to make it work. And a farmer is always, in this day and age, prayerful, Relying upon God, committing his prosperity, his, his benefit from the work that he did to the Lord God Almighty. No control other than what he could control, and they worked diligently at that. And so, James is telling these people, be patient. Trust in God. Believe that he is sovereign in all the circumstances in the, of the lives of men. He can prosper you. The number of times that we see the hand of God doing things that just have no explanation in the material realm, in the scriptures, is unbelievable. And he is always beneficent so wonderful and loving. You think about Jesus when he prospered? When he said a blessing of thanksgiving over the loaves and the fishes and they were multiplied incredibly, miraculously, he didn't say, take it all and hoard it. No. He gave it. He shared the blessing of the prosperity that God had put upon him. And I talked about that last week. How that is an example of the spirit at work in the heart of a believer. So he says, be patient. Trust God in all of your circumstances, no matter what. Be careful. Stand firm in your belief, in your faith, because the Lord's coming is near. 
The Lord's coming is near. Do not forget this one thing, my dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. He is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting any one soul to perish, but everyone to come to repentance and to a knowledge of the truth. But time is short. I read from Psalm 39 a couple of three weeks ago about David recognizing that the, width, the, the, the length of his life is like the width of his hand. Short. Psalm 103, men are like grass. The, wither, the, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of God stands forever. And when a man passes away, it's like the wind blows and his place is remembered no more. In our hearts and in our minds, we are so important. And the struggles and the things that we go through every day, they're so big and so incredibly important. And I think about, as I, mute, as I meditate on these things, I think about the things that I have worried about in my life and how much energy I put into trying to control circumstances and outcomes. And I have to discipline myself. I've learned to discipline myself to say, calm down, back it up, look up, give thanks, and ask God to have his hand upon this. Didn't have to worry. So I look back. What was I worried about? Not being in control. And nobody knows when Jesus is coming back. Even he admitted, the angels don't know and I don't know. But when I come back, everybody will know. It won't be small. When the lightning comes from the east and goes to the west, Everybody will see. John Piper tells a story of when he was uh, on an airplane one time and they had to divert their route because there was a tremendous thunders and lightning storm over one of the Great Lakes. He was up in, he lives up in Minnesota, I think. And he said he got to watch that lightning from the seat of his plane, from a distance, but it was everywhere. When that lightning bolt strikes, the whole sky is lit. And that is just a tiny foretaste of what it will be like when Jesus comes. All darkness will be shrouded in light and everything that is will be seen for exactly what it is. A light that cannot hide anything that will not hide anything. And he says he is coming to judge. In verse 9, don't grumble with each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Now he was talking to people who were really struggling. And they were learning to share. They were learning to build new community within the fact that they were dispersed and they had no real solid foundation of place, but they were becoming a people that had to learn to live together in a way that was new. And God would prove himself to them. He would show his hand to them in provision. And he says, so be careful, don't grumble with each other. It's gonna be difficult, especially when there's people involved. Everybody wants, but when everybody wants the same thing, that's a very important factor in success. And that God would be honored and glorified in their midst, and that they would rejoice in their ability to share what they had with each other. This was something magnificent and new, and new.
So we are to be patient in circumstances. And he cites the examples of the prophets who were been blessed, were considered blessed because they persevered. Did you know that Jeremiah was thrown down a well? He was so persecuted by the people. He, he was faithful to preaching the hard word of God to the Hebrew people, to the Israelites. And he, they took him and they threw him into a well which had like wet clay, soft wet clay in the bottom so that he would sink slowly, like in slow sand, not quick sand. And people came and rescued him wonderfully. But those people, he persevered in truth, in the difficulties of maintaining his faith in God, his promises, and in his commandments. And Job's perseverance is legendary. But look at what, look at what the Lord finally brought about in his life. And he says that the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. So as we wait for his return, which is soon, we must be patient in our circumstances. And we must stand firm in our faith. Now, enough about them. What about us? What would James say to the Christian church in this day and age? Our suffering is not necessarily with poverty. It's not necessarily with overt persecution like them. Perhaps our suffering or our struggle has to do with our prosperity. A.W. Tozer has a devotional that I read. I'll share it with you. Remember, we're looking at ourselves now. And I'm asking, what would James say to the church in this day and age in the United States of America, the Western church? The, he quotes Matthew 24, 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Jesus' words about the church. The first and the greatest commandment is to love God with every power of our entire being. Where love like that exists, there can be no place for a second object. Yet popular Christianity has as one of its most effective talking points, the idea that God exists to help people to get ahead in this world. The good of the poor has become, uh, the God of the poor has become the God of an affluent society. We hear that Christ no longer refuses to be a judge or a divider between money hungry brothers. He can now be persuaded to assist the brother that has accepted him to get the better of the brother who has not. Whoever seeks God as a mean means toward a desired end will not find him. God will not be one of many treasures. His mercy and grace are infinite and his patient understanding is beyond measure. But he will not aid men in selfish striving after personal gain. If we love God as much as we should, Surely we cannot dream of a loved object beyond him which he might help us to attain. The television is full of preachers that will tell you that Jesus, the creator of the universe, 
in your life is to give you everything, to give you the blessings, to make you all you can be, to give you your best day ever. I don't think Jesus would agree with that. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The same spirit that was at work against the work of God amongst his people in the time of James, the apostle, James, the brother of Jesus, is the same spirit that is at work today. And as he looked to destroy Jesus' church, through the circumstances that they were struggling with is the same spirit that today seeks to destroy Jesus' church in the midst of the circumstances in which they find themselves. And we must recognize that our struggle is not with flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. We must recognize that God requires us to love him before all things, above money, above comfort, nothing should Replace Jehovah Jireh, the Lord my provider, in our hearts and in our minds. And we must be careful as believers in Christ not to make God a God of convenience and a God of blessing only, but a God of holiness and in love. We must not see him as a means to an end. The end that God seeks is the conforming of our souls into the image of Christ, his one and only son, who gave of himself for us. And he is a God of holiness. And he does not compromise. And he is coming to judge the living and the dead. And he is coming to judge his people for what they have done with the knowledge of the truth and the faith that he has given to them through his grace by his son, Jesus Christ. We must remember that we will be judged for what we have done in our flesh, what we have put into our minds and in our hearts. We must seek him above all things. The Apostle Paul, in reflecting upon all that he had in this life, to the Philippian church says, but whatever I gained, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is found through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so somehow, attaining to the resurrection of the dead. I want to learn how to die to myself, 
to the passions and lusts of my flesh, to the pride that lives deep within my heart. I want to learn like Christ to die like that so that I might participate in the resurrection. And this is not the resurrection from the dead of a body. This is called an out resurrection, the resurrection of my soul in this time and in this place and in this world. I want to become like him in that death. It's a bold statement for anyone to make. Because the greatest battle that a man can ever win is against himself. Plato said that. The greatest adversary you will ever face is you. That is truth. That is truth. And Paul says, I want to become like him in his death. What a thing to embrace. I want a new car. I want a new camper. I want to, I want to, I want, I want. <laughs> it's good to want things. It's good to make plans. But the last thing he says, above all, my brothers, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, or you will be condemned. It's important to acknowledge the sovereignty of God in all of our circumstances and that it, he wills and works within our souls according to his purpose and plan for each one of us. And he is faithful. He will see it through to the end. He will see it through to the end. And he is coming back, and no one knows the hour or the day. When my father passed away, like I'm standing here right now, he dropped and hit the floor. And he was gone. His heart stopped, and it was over. And no one knows the day or the hour when that will be their calling. But all of our days are numbered, and that is true. Everyone was written in his book before even one of them came to be, David says in Psalms. So our days are short. Our life is like a breath. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of God lives forever. And we are to live like that hour is soon. And it may be today, it may be tomorrow. I don't know when it will be, but I dwell upon this. Love God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. This is the greatest command. Amen? Well, the last song we have today is one, the last time I remember doing this was over at the uh, Alternatives. Remember when we were in that little theater over there? Soon and very soon, we are going to see the Lord. Hallelujah. So, number six.